remind you all that that when you record, when you talk, please talk in your microphone. Cece has her own personal microphone. She's got to switch hers on. Yeah, because I know she has to talk. I know Cece. Uh, so just remember we're recording and Pam wants to hear and put that all on. So uh, Elena had a really nice request last week. Was it Elena? I think so. Somebody came in my office, I think it was Elena, and said, I've got this on uh, book audio books. And when you just tell me a chapter number, I don't know what I'm hearing. Can you please tell us what were the phrase is each week? <laughs> and so I've started doing that. And uh, I'm also, if you talk to other people, uh, like Sandra's joining us this morning, she'd been awfully busy. And it's just really starting to read the book. But to me, these phrases and the discussion is valuable enough. If you haven't read it, it's okay. We can still get something from the discussion. So I would hope you'd come in and or drop in or whatever and, and get the book. And we've had our linguist start uh, showing up now to... Uh, to terrorists, our, our talking uh, expert, I guess, would be the best term. I, have to get I think you have speaking expertise. That sounds much better oh, than, yes. you know, gift of gab. But, and sometimes she's, she comes in and says, this chapter is just a repeat of that. And this means that. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um I, i'm still liking that we have short phrases we can discuss them quickly we can move through it and move on to the next one and i hope you're incorporating uh these into your daily or when you're talking to consumers or spouses or children grandchildren whatever if uh and remember microphone if you're talking um does anybody, has anybody found or would like to share a story of, hey, this is some success I've had in the last few weeks by using this phrase? Does anybody want to volunteer? I don't blame you. Vol volunteering is tough. You're being recorded and everything. <laughs> well, it's not that I've used it in the last week, but um, reading the book, I've realized that I do use some of them um, already. Mm -hmm. um, like one of them is about feeling. And so I always ask, you know, how do you feel? You get the warm fuzzies when you come in or can you see yourself living here? Um, so I do use some of them already. I just haven't had the opportunity the last couple of weeks and and one i've used all of my career uh is uh, how important is that so i tell people right up front if i'm looking for homes i can find what you want in the in your price range where you want to be i just can't put all three together so which one of those three are we going to compromise on if we have to if we can't find what you want in the, at the right price, do you want to lower your wants or raise your price? Can we move outside your area if we need to? So that's something I've always done, but I think he takes it a step further. Elena, you had something, Dan? Yeah, so it's not that I used it, but look, later I was in a conversation with someone a couple of weeks ago, and then I listened to this book, and it was the exact question that the guy asked me when I was my buyer. And I handled it totally weird, wrong, <laughs> but I was looking back like, oh, I should have just listened. But that's part of my problem is they, we, they ask us a question and we go on for like five minutes. How's the market? And then we tell them our knowledge, but really just shut up, you know, just <laughs> shut up and put it back on them. Like, what do you know about the market right now? You know, and I just thought back at that conversation, like. I totally did lose him, but I didn't know how to stop. It was just like, I was throwing up this, how's the market back at him. And really, I didn't have to do that. I mean, I just 
It, Quiet. We're going to get to it in a minute, but one of the things they said uh, uh, that he says, whoever is asking the questions is in control of the conversation. And I used to be amazed at my wife, and you probably have similar experiences, but I would watch her talk to somebody and whoever she was talking to thought they were the most important person in her life at that moment. And it had nothing to do with what she was saying about herself. It had to do with the questions that she was asking them about themselves. She controlled the conversation. She found out about them. She revealed very little about herself. And yet these people were thrilled that Tracy Cassidy or Tracy Garrett wanted to find out more about them. And so asking those questions, as you just brought up, most important thing you can do with client is make them feel that important. But, okay, let's move on to chapter four. Opening fact questions. Now, this is something that I think many of us do automatically and many of us may not do automatically. It's more of a framework. And, I like, and if you think about the framework, then it's easy. You want a polite opening. Hey, Tulio, how are you? Um, it's a great day. Yeah, I know. Tulio responds, Tulio, how are you? You're fine. Isn't it wonderful weather we're having right now? Yes, it is. A mutually agreeable at fact. What are you going to do this afternoon to get more business? Oh, now I've just asked him a question. A hard question. What are you going to do this afternoon? Thank you. Uh, I am still looking for the new people and uh, prepare, uh, prepare the new people to buy a house this afternoon. And that's nice. Someday I'm going to ask you the next question is, so what are you doing to look for them? But I won't put you on the spot now. <laughs> but that's a framework. You've got to have something nice to say. You've got to have a, a fact. And in my case, it was the weather is nice. Now, what are you going to do today? Did anybody read the examples that uh, our author had? Any anything strike out at you? I'm more of a let's just have to say I, I think the the heart is going. Hey, how's it going? How's the day? Love the weather. Blah. I hate that. They know why I'm calling. It's about business. So let's just have to say hi. This is Tracy with Better Homes and Gardens. I just wanted to follow up real quick to make sure you got that gift certificate I sent you that was closing on ABC where it can't done. And they're like. Oh, yeah, I did. That was great. Really appreciate it. And then we've moved on, but we've made a connection. But I'm not waiting for their time, my time, or doing what so many people will find a very awkward, I'm trying to connect with you on a soulful level and talk about the weather. Yes, but you are following up as a... But they don't know I'm going to call. Right, but you're still following up as a follow-up just to make sure everything went well you're not establishing relationships where well, i'm I... trying to <laughs> well trying so to. so i'm gonna i'm gonna reframe you a little bit okay. hi this is tracy garrett from better homes and gardens we sent you a gift certificate lately i just wonder if you've had the chance to use it there is that that opens them up a little bit more if you did what did you eat down there was it really good well and that's where the conversation to, uh -huh. but it's not my opening gig. It's not my opening line. But it, but it, because they're already tense when they hear well, Tracy with better hooks and cards. Oh crap! Now I've got somebody else to target me. You know, trying to recruit me. Or Hold on, whatever. just a second here. Some of these agents are very nasty on the phone. That's it's, true. And if I don't just get to the point, and then all of a sudden they're relaxed because oh, it's about the gift certificate. Oh, okay, cool. You know, and, and they might, we may talk about, are you going to use it? If you have used it, you know, because usually I call a week after I've sent it. 
And then we talk about what they ate. Now, you know, hey, we really look forward to working with you again. Go ahead. The relationship is built later in the conversation, but I want to get it out when I'm calling. You're like me <laughs> in that respect. <laughs> but it has come to my attention that I'm assuming their thought process when I take that stance. I'm assuming they're thinking this. I'm assuming they're going to react like that. I have no idea. If you think about it, you really don't because you don't know the person on the other end you of the know, line. I am giving the credit of their business. True, true. But I mean, I'm thinking of a more of a general statement. When when we assume, when we take that stance of, oh, they're busy or they're going to be pissed off because I've called or they're not going to be happy because it's inconvenient. When we assume that, then that's not giving them justice to, or it, we're not allowing them to tell us, hey, I really appreciate you calling. We're just assuming the office. And yeah, I do the, the same thing, thing. But the only thing I'm assuming is that they're busy and their time is valuable. Well, in the, your situation, I'm talking general. Okay. I'm not talking general. I, yeah, because I found, I found that I do the same thing. I did that to my husband for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> And he goes, you're thinking too much into this. I was not thinking that. I'm going to uh, I'm going to jump in because Lynn is exactly right, and telling her she's wrong is a really difficult place because she used to talk for a living, so that means she can argue you to death. I'm just telling you that. <laughs> but um, I like uh, first off, I'm going to say that every one of you has called somebody and assumed you better get it over with quick and get off the phone. You've done it. If you're in this business, it's okay. You're assuming that they're, and you may be correct, but by asking an open-ended question, rather than telling them, you may get a response or the response may be, no, I haven't, I gotta go. Okay, they're busy, let them go. But are we cutting off the people who would talk too quickly? Just because you're building a relationship doesn't mean you're asking them to come join our company. Just like when you guys call, you aren't asking them to buy or sell a house today. We're talking about, I, I love this one about an outreach for a sell by owner. Hi, it's Greg Fox from Better Homes and Gardens. You don't know me, but I've sold a lot of properties in your area and it looked like you were wanting to sell. Is the property still available? Have I asked anything insulting? Have I asked them to list with me? Have I asked them if they still want to sell it? They want to tell me, yeah, it is. Great. Can you tell me the price? I may have some people interested. Now I've interested them in taking the, the conversation deeper. And if they say no, and I'm tired of your real estate agents call me. Great. Just checking. It's not available. I won't bother you anymore. Thanks. So I haven't assumed anything, and I've given them the opportunity to talk further if they want to. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and she says, and I ain't going to do that crap, Greg. No. <laughs> well. No, but what, the for sale by owner, no, that was a good shtick. It is a good shtick. And asking if somebody's had dinner yet on us, there's nothing wrong with that. Most of the people I find that I talk to have not even been to the office to find a certificate. Don't even know it exists. Right. And then you'd say, oh, really? Well, we send gift certificates out. You ought to stop by and check on it. Let me know if you don't have it. And that's what I do. There you go. See, recruiting, so what we do is a lot like what you guys do every do. We're just trying to get agents who are already pissed off because somebody is calling them three times a week to ask them is greg retiring yet <laughs> is greg's heart still working <laughs> does anybody else want to talk about the framework of asking questions lynn you did a really nice job too by the way i've been my husband for 30 years <laughs> Like, and everybody else in here has done that too, haven't they? CC? She's soaking it all in. Got to turn that on.
Uh, well, I was just going to say that I think that we make like different calls for different reasons. And True. that sometimes, you know, like we have a direct purpose that, you know, this is why I'm calling you and I can directly state my business. And that helps to ease into the conversations. But then depending on the person who we're talking to, sometimes it's, you know, it's nice to ease into the conversation with a little bit of small talk before maybe getting to the point. Or sometimes it's nice to like let people make my point for me, right? So even if I am calling them about business, like say they're my sphere of influence, I can start with the small talk. And then, you know, if they're like a nice friend, they're gonna automatically ask me about myself, which is asking me about like real estate, if that's how they know me. So I don't know, like I can see that it could be both. But I, some I, of these like small talk things, I don't really like, and I think they're lame and that wouldn't sound natural for me. Well, but, Oh. Well, and I agree. And I think there's some of it you have to read your audience. Yeah. You know, I, I, I agree. Um, when I was helping Charlie set up, uh, I forget what the name of the company was, but before we were CSS, we had another company that set up our appointments. And Charlie said that he had to set up his operators so that who was calling would show up on a map. Because if you're in New York City or Jersey, and you ask how the weather is, they're going to hang up on you. They get really ticked off if you try that small talk. But if you're calling down south in Alabama to a small town, they want to talk about Uncle Joe and Aunt Martha and the restaurant up the street that just closed before they ever get to what you're doing. So there is a lot of to what you say about reading your audience. I'm saying there, if you're trying to build a relationship, having a little small talk or at least a question that gets that requires a response is better way to start them building a relationship than just saying this is why I called hope you're happy goodbye and hang up that's not as good the way he does it though I think kind of um, fits the fact that he's not asking a question as small talk he's actually making a statement and then asking their purpose of either contacting or or something to that effect. Is this the only property you're interested in? So instead of the, you know, but I like the idea that he made a statement. He didn't mm -hmm. start with, how are you today? And then when um, telemarkers call, and how are you today? What do you want? Right. <laughs> Fair enough. You don't care about Yeah, me. I know. Yeah. I get so. I get irritated with so. Oh, I'm like. like and so, how are you? What do you want? Yeah. I always say, uh, when I can, I'm like, I'm really busy. How can I help you? And and I will, and I will counter with what Lynn just said. You're making an you're making an assumption that everybody you call will react the same. Try to find a medium ground of if I don't know you, how can I? ask you a little bit without sharing about Uncle Joe and Aunt Martha in the restaurant up the street. Uh, and I like his opening statements. It's Greg Fox, I'm from Better Homes and Gardens. I see that you recently had your house on the market. Um, it's Is it still something you're trying to sell? If I had, I do a lot in the area, I just want to keep it in my back of my brain, that kind of thing, and let them talk to you. Okay, let's go on to chapter five. What is your experience? I love this one. Somebody's vibrating. <laughs> I love this one because I think we've all experienced those people that think they know everything because they've been on Zillow and they've researched and they've done this and they've done that. And they have a tendency to actually want to prove you wrong. And they'll say, oh, you're wrong. Or that's not what I read. I mean, they're out to almost make it before you've established a really good relationship, but with that, you know, first meeting, they're like, they're looking for something that you've said wrong. And so I love the fact that, you know, if they're in that combative mood or argument of mood, I can say, what is your experience with this? You know, I love this one. I like the uh, idea, but let, let me go into where Elena was a minute ago. But client asked her how the market was. And her response was to tell everything about the market. 
And perhaps it would say, have you been reading a lot about the market? Which is a different way of saying, what's your experience? No, I haven't read a thing. Oh, have you been out looking at houses? Have you seen, have you tried to make offers that haven't gone through? You know, things, questions that lead them on to further subjects. I had, I read one time that um, when somebody's asking for how's the market, they're not necessarily interested in the overall market, but they may be interested more specifically in their neighborhood market. So a good question would be, are you asking as an overall or are you wanting to know more about your specific neighborhood, which allows you that intro into maybe possibly helping them? Well, and this our previous book had a way of saying, answer the question and throw out a tidbit of knowledge. And so if I start, if somebody says, how's the market? Say, are you asking about the overall or are you asking specifically? Because, you know, real estate is very local. What happens over on this side of town doesn't happen over there. What do you want to know? And so then you've taken the question further instead of gushing all of, you know, the, you know, I can quote stats all day long, but will it help? Sorry, Elena, we're throwing you under the bus. Yeah, I was on a tangent. <laughs> <But I couldn't, laughs> so he's got a question in here that I don't know that he answered with his questions. But if you're challenged with the question of how much is your commission, how can we respond other than 6%, 7%, 4%? What is your experience on how agents um, compute their commission amount based on what they're willing to do? Or what's your experience in, in something to, that didn't come out quite as... Have you had experience in agents much? in their commissions? Have you been quoted something? Have you read something online about commissions that caused you concern? Let's see where they go. Now that some people, you know, I can see CC eyeing me over there. That sounds evasive to me. <laughs> well, I feel evasive even answering it that way. How's that? And at some point you say, you know, the commissions kind of go up into what the market will bear. But what's your experience with agents and their commissions? Do you earn a commission or do you get a commission? Earn a commission. Depends on which agent you are. Is that what I heard, Elena? <laughs> I like uh, this one. What is, if you're talking to a listing and he says, What are your, what is your commission? You don't have to address commission. You can say, Well, what's your experience with selling houses? Have they sold a house before? And then let them delve back into commissions if it's important. What is your experience in buying new homes? Con new construction is really a whole different critter than resale homes, especially in today's market. Has anybody else had any examples in what your experience is? Has anybody challenged the how much more powerful it is finding out where they're coming from what's your experience well tammy and i were just talking she's got a friend that she's got that wants to show she wants uh tammy to show her house tonight but she wants to do a fizbo to sell her own home and i was just telling tammy you know, ask what her experience is with selling houses, ask her what her experience is with getting a uh, buyer approved through a lender, you know, and maybe put some doubt in that person's mind about going that route could be a good opener. I would also warn them, you know, you don't have to just use what's your experience. You can combine these up. If you put your house on the market, you're going to get a whole lot of phone calls from real estate agents who want to list your home. Are you prepared to deal with all those phone calls? Will your day job let you take phone calls while you're, because there's 
The market's moving so fast right now. You could also ask them, what is it that makes you want to do it for a sell by owner? We're assuming it's commission. Maybe it's not. And if commission is the only thing that comes up, offer them. Um, sometimes if I'm helping somebody buy a home and sell a home, I can lower my commission on one side if that's the only thing that's holding you back. And then you get all the convenience. Then you can get all the convenience of having a professional realtor to take care of those phone calls and handle the inspections and all those things without paying the full but be prepared for what you're going to charge them before you go into that conversation. You don't want to go, let me think about it. <laughs> That's where I feel like a lot of FISBOs will flounder is, you know, their experience in the actual process and how a real estate agent can really pay for their own commission and above. Well, it's not only negotiation, it is coordination of a lot of details. And the same issue why I don't believe a part-time agent is very good. And I think that was one of the questions they had in this is, you know, how do you feel about part-time agents? When you are, when you've got to coordinate all these details and you have a regular job anyway, it's tough. Right. It's tough as, and if your client has a job and they're buying a house and they want to sell one too, that's a lot to coordinate in their daily lives. And they'll find themselves pushed to the max. <clears throat> or they'll find a buyer who has a buyer agent and the buyer agent wants, you know, 5%. And because even though I'm not listing it, I've got to take care of both sides. So there's a lot of ways to think through some of that. Okay, we have two chapters left in 20 minutes, roughly. So chapter six, any more comments on? Okay, so I explained earlier, I think is how import, important is it? This to me is one of the most powerful statements we can have. Understanding this can greatly assist the managing of expectations and reaching compromises. If you know what the boundaries are beforehand. How many people have listed a house and helped the buyers or the sellers set a price? Everybody, right? How many people ask ahead, what's the lowest price you'll take? Does anybody do that? I want to know before, I want to know what's in their brain beforehand. If we say the house is worth 220000 I want to know, well, if somebody brings an offer of 195, what are you going to say? And they may not know. And I say, right, exactly. That's why I want you to think about it now before that offer comes in and you have to suddenly decide in a matter of minutes or hours, am I going to take it or not? You need to already have in your brain what's the least amount you'll take. So that, how important is it is, I've asked the same question. How important is it that you get 220 for your house? What happens if an offer comes in late, late, lower? Where are you and your wife, you should have discussions, or you and your husband, sorry, Cece. You're, you couple, <laughs> the couple, have a discussion about where you're, Lower end is, gosh, I am just so, I'm thinking, I'm replaying conversations in my head I've had with somebody else. So that's why it came out that way. I'm digging the hole deeper, aren't I? <laughs> what, uh, <coughs> I think whenever two or more people are in, whether it's 
husband and wife, six brothers and sisters, a lawyer, whatever, that decision should be had. Where is the bottom end that you're willing to accept? Because you need to know that up front before we get the offer. I had a recent experience. Um, I just put him under contract, but when we started looking, he had a house to sell in Emporia. Well, a week later, his house was under contract, but it's not due to close until May. So in the beginning, I was thinking, okay, well, there's some sellers out there that uh, an extended closing would work for, you know, I can always, you know, if you're interested in a house, I can call the agent up and see if it'll work before we go look at it. And then I realized that I've actually got tools in my toolbox that I could help with. And so about two weeks into showing him, him houses and discussing with him, I said, you know, I've got a mortgage company that'll do a bridge loan interest only. Will that work for you? And he's under contract to close March 30th because he's got that interest only bridge loan. And that made him more comfortable in pursuing finding a house at this point. So it was, I should have asked how important is it that we get that closing date out there? And I should have also told him, Hey, I've got this. So now how important is it? So we were able to get him under contract and he's happy and the seller's happy. And, and it's because I was able to pull up a tool out of my toolbox and I have found recently, and this is totally off topic, <laughs> that in talking to different lenders, they all have different programs that would actually benefit your buyers. And to know about the different programs with these different lenders is really critical. Um, there's Thrive has the bridge loan interest only, um, fl flat, is it flat branch? Shoot, I can't remember. Tasha Tro Trobridge. Um, she's got a, an, a rehab rehab loan that's amazing, totally amazing. And, and that's another thing that I'm looking at with some of my clients is they want to be somewhere a, a, in price, but we're not finding it. So we're looking at rehabs because I have access to a rehab loan. So if you guys know of any other loans that might be a little different than just the norm, please let me know. So I have that in my little toolbox. Sometimes I will answer a listing question by pointing out the how important is it without ever asking them. So if someone comes up to me and just flat says, how much can you sell my house for? My answer is almost always, I can sell your house for a million dollars if you want to wait long enough. And I can sell it in the next five minutes if you'll take 10 bucks. So the value of your price depends on when you want to move and how long you want to sit on it. Right now, typically houses sell in this time frame. So, so it's true. If you sit on a house long enough, in you know, 20, 30, 40 years, you can probably get a million bucks for some of these houses in Wichita. But I guarantee you in five minutes, I'll pull out 10 bucks if you want to sell it right now. So where do you, you know, it's not as simple as what's my house worth. You have to find out more about their motivation. And I'm illustrating that with the how is important is it that you sell your house quickly? Some people want to sell right away. Some people want maximum money. Some people don't want to sell till they find the house they want to move into. You have to weigh all those things into the, the picture. Has any other illustrations of how important is it that you guys have used? I have a wants and a needs um, piece of paper. And I ask them, you know, what are your needs and how important is it versus how, your wants? And, and identify what's important to you. So that's a take on this. How important are these items to you, this criteria to you? I was going to ask you, because you sit on new homes. Well, I just really like, you know, asking these uh, questions like, what is your experience or how important is it? Because it really it makes for much more effective communication that I'm not off on a tangent telling them things that they don't need or care about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm these questions really get to the heart of like, 
what what is it that they fear or you know what I mean like it just really gets to the crux of the matter which makes for much more effective communication overall I agree yeah. I I there's one tip I've never used in here that he had at the end that I like and it's not so much that they need it for me but rather they need to think about it put a sliding scale to their list of preferences you know, if I've got a list of 10 preferences, how many of on one to 10 with 10 got to have and one I don't care, where are they? Well, I got to have location. Okay, that's number one. Price, eight. Okay. The fourth bedroom, four. Having that sliding skill in their own mind helps them to define what they need. So, Back to your having experience thing, if they've not been out looking at homes a lot in the past, or they're living in an apartment, I might want them to concentrate more on how important are certain features. If they've lived in their existing home, I ask what they really love about it, what they hate, what they're looking to improve on. You know, and people don't normally move without getting some sort of improvement. It could be a more modern home. It could be larger. It could be smaller. It could be a uh, better location. It could, you know, be a number of things. But if you ask those things, it's helping them to define. And that would go back to this. Uh, how important is it to you? I can help you find what you want. You have to tell me which is the most important. Lynn, you look like you were going to say something. No? Uh, microphone. I was just thinking I'm remodeling my house. And when I walked, when I bought it, I got the warm fuzzies when I walked in my husband, especially, but I got the warm fuzzies too. And I'm remodeling it. <laughs> and I, I don't even want to be there anymore. And I was trying to think why. And it's because the colors we picked are cold. They're gray because that's what's in right now. And I, and I just, just was thinking how important is it to pick the right color <laughs> for your house or you know how important is different things to you when deciding on a house well interestingly you brought that up because this morning better homes and gardens sent out an email which i forwarded to you all about the new colors for this year and the colors going out as asap Grays are going out ASAP because they're cold and they're really talking about more earth tones, deeper colors, warmer uh, colors are important. But again, that's another decision you're taught when you're talking to people. How important is it that the house is painted right? Remember, paint's cheap comparatively. We can paint the inside walls, blah, 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 blah. So remember that. Okay. What do you understand? Last chapter we're talking about this week. How often do you find yourself in a conversation that quickly becomes a debate because the person speaking with you seems to know more than you do? <laughs> to influence others who are confident about their position, you must move the other person's positions from one of certainty to one of doubt. Obviously, I'm not necessarily very good at it because Tracy isn't ready to change yet. But <laughs> had I had been a little better about asking questions, maybe she would have reached her own thing of, you know, maybe I could ask another question or two before I hang up on them. Or at least give them the chance to tell me I'm too busy to talk to you and hang up on me. Just, just saying that. Yeah. 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 I could see you calling him back angry. <clears throat> so moving somebody from who's very confident, starting to tell you things, how do you move them to one where they're open to hearing you? What do you understand? Where did you get that knowledge? What's your experience? Those kind of all kind of go together. Because you can't, yeah, you get in trouble if you get in. I 
might even have to practice saying these phrases. Microphone, then, please. I'd have to practice saying these phrases in a neutral tone instead of a bitchy tone. Because when I phrase it in my head, I already sound bitchy as hell. So. Know your facts. You know your business. You've got this down at home. You've been doing it forever. And somebody who's a first time, they're selling their home for the first time, knows more than your 30 years. And it's really hard when you're being attacked because you feel like you're good at to reel it back in calm it down and focus on the question what is your experience what is your understanding of this uh, to find out they don't know squad but you can't tell them that because then that'll go wrong so if you're on the phone the trick is put a big shit-eating grin on your face sorry i cussed Hi there. <laughs> so you don't like real estate agents, huh? <laughs> you know? And that big smile on your face, I wouldn't say that, but you could say something like, what is your experience with real estate agents? What is your experience selling homes? What are some of the questions he has? What do you understand about the pitfalls of working with part-time agent? Well, I'm gonna list with my sister who just got started and she's working at, you know, Coke Industries during the day. So she, can, so she can show me houses at night. What is your experience working with a part-time agent? Just wondering. Well, I've never done it before. Huh? Curious rather than condescending is what I need to focus on. Curious. There you that go. That I'm not I trying like to that. prove wrong, you know. And prove yeah, you don't want to right, get a... Even though I am, but... Uh, but that I'm just curious about where they got it. And I like the, you know, with Tammy's little example of the for sale by owner, well, what's your experience buying and selling homes? What do you understand about it? Well, I've never done it before, but I've read on the internet, you know, I read about brain surgery on the internet, but I'm not performing it on myself quite yet. Thought about it, but. <laughs> Well, Cece made a really good point. Um, several years ago, one of my trainers had said, always stay in a state of curiosity. Oh, I like that. And, and he said, you know, just as like a parent, your kid comes to you and says, can I do this? And if you're going to say no, the reason you say no is because you don't, you're not informed. You're not informed. You need more information. So if you stay in a state of curiosity, even as a parent or real estate agent and ask the next question well who's going with you you know um, my I have a daughter in this situation right now 11 year old grandson wants to have girls over the house <laughs> you know um, but stay in a state of curiosity and I forget that sometimes but I think it's profound so thank you Cece for reminding me and sometimes that state of curiosity will even take you a step further. You're not trying to debate or get in trouble with them, but um, let's go back to our for sale by owner. Well, what is your experience buying and selling homes? Well, I've, I've bought four and I've sold three in my life. And one of them I did it for sale by owner and I want to try it again. You know, that might work out for you. If you run into any trouble, Give me a call. I don't know that I can help, but I'll, I'll give you, I'll lend you an ear. I didn't ask for the listing. Um, you guys all know the phrase, I'm not an attorney. I can't practice law in the state of Kansas. So you can't give legal advice, but you could come up with a hypothetical. You know, I had somebody that had trouble with their sewer system too. Here's someone you could call. And you've taken, you know, and turned a very quick conversation, helped them out, and you might get that client back in the future. So understanding their ex experience from a point of curiosity will help your answer a lot better than arguing with them. Good point. Okay, so last week I told you guys I was going to do this, and I've started it. A little five by five, okay? And at the bottom, it says, I'm not sure if it's for you, but, uh huh. and then I, at the top, I gave some examples right out of the book. 
and I'm going to put these all over my cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> So I can really, really embed them in my head as far as what to say. Um, I have a tendency to, you know, if somebody asks me a question, I answer it. Right. And instead, I should be pretty much asking a question back instead of answering it. Give it a short answer, maybe, but, get, you know, then ask another question. And so that's kind of why I'm doing this so that I can get better at communication. So uh, one of the things we said in the last book, and, and Cheryl uh, really took this to heart, when I was in recruiting school, I wasn't allowed to give an answer until I was asked, I had asked 20 questions. That was a lot. Because every level would take me down to a different you know, every question could lead me to a new level. And what brokers tend to do, much like you guys, if somebody comes up and says, and I'm interviewing them, and I, they say, we don't have a CRM where I'm at now. My tendency is, oh, we've got a great one. Let me show it to you. <laughs> and then we say, then I say, okay, what else are you looking for? Now, I liken this to taking a buyer out and they walk into the office and they say, I need a five bedroom house. OK, here's 500 of them. Let's go look at them. And you show them all the houses with five bedrooms, bring them back in and say, all right, now what else you want? You haven't asked them about the kitchen, the location, the price or anything else. So you really need to delve deeper and ask more questions about, well, you don't have a great CRM where you're at. Do you have any CRM at all? Yeah, but I never use it. Oh, you don't use it. Why don't you use that CRM? Well, I have a database, but I just had, couldn't figure out how to upload it quite yet. Ah, so uploading it is an issue for you. Does that mean if you could upload it, you might be more willing to use it? Well, I don't know, because at my brokerage, two brokerages ago, they did this, you know, and you can keep asking more questions to find out where's the real pain point. You know, the pain point wasn't up here about the CRM. It's about a brokerage five brokers ago where they took all your contacts and kept them and so on and so forth. So you have to keep, and I it's hard to do because, because I want to ask, I just want to tell you what we got. And what we got may be not what you're really looking for. I think it goes right along with this whole thing. In the ICP. Uh huh. Certified tech, but just because somebody comes in and says, "This is what we're doing," <laughs> do I just dive in and start touching stuff? I go, well, "What were you doing when it did this?" Or, "What have you done? What were the steps? What have you done since you turned it on last?" What is it? And I start playing again twenty questions. Yeah. To find out what the real issue of the computer is, or what they're really having trouble with. Maybe it's not finding the website. Maybe they can find it, but they just want to, you know, make it easier to find it so they don't have to type it in again. Yeah. My IT guy had to train me to quit telling him what the solution was, tell him what the problem was. But I tend to want to go in and tell him how I'm going to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't like that. <laughs> All right. We have covered these chapters. How are we doing? Is everybody happy continuing doing this? Yes. Okay. Uh, the next four chapters are eight, nine, 10, and 11. And I think you'll find that as we go, some of the phrases get a little bit more um, easier in depth, deeper. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with the first phrases, uh, as Lynn pointed out, the one she just typed up, which was, I don't know it for you, but to me, that's kind of a, I don't know how I feel about that one yet. I love the, the one that prioritizes things. Chapter eight is how would you feel if I love that question? That is a great question. I know. So eight, nine, 10, 11. See you guys next week. Thank you very, very much.
Yes. 